Good evening, everybody. Let's get started. So pre-lab two, I posted an announcement. There was uh, a source in pre-lab two that showed 15 volts and uh, it, it should have been four volts. 15 volts was the old lab when we didn't use the analog discovery two. Four volts is the, the new voltage. So if you did submit your pre-lab with 15 volts as the solution, that's okay. But run the run the calculations with four volts so when you come <clears throat> when you when you do the lab uh in remotely uh you, you'll have a four volt supply so you'll have to use those resistor values take a look at the assignments so pre-lab two is due thursday uh quiz three is due friday and office hours are posted for the tas so use their lab links you'll see i, I posted a note on the Canvas page about this. So take a look at that. <clears throat> it, you just use your lab link to get to their office hours. My office hours will be right after class. So come join if you have any questions or just want to listen to other people's questions and answers and discussion. And as always, ask questions during class. I think this has been going great. Thank you for the participation. And then otherwise, stay muted and that will keep the background noise down and I'll keep my fingers crossed about keeping this connection and, and not having any technical issues. So far, so good. So, but if I do drop off, wait around a few minutes, I'll be back. So I wanted to uh, bring up the pre-lab. <clears throat> so this is the pre-lab you see on the screen right now. The way this relates to what we're doing in class is you're going to actually uh, build a voltage divider out of resistors and demonstrate Kirchhoff's voltage law to show that it works. You'll be within, you should be within maybe tens, a few tens of millivolts uh, from theory. You're always going to have some differences. There, the resistor values have tolerances. Uh, your resistor values will be 5% tolerance. They're usually better than that, but, but you can expect some error in the resistance and also in your measurement, there's some error in the measurement. So, you know, don't look for exact values when you do your measurements, but you should be pretty close, maybe within, like I said, tens of millivolts of, of theory. You'll also build an adjustable voltage reference using a, a voltage divider. So here's, here's the circuit you're going to build um, as a voltage divider, just a fixed, a set of resistors and you'll do that. And then here's the circuit you'll build to demonstrate a current divider and you'll run through the theory in your pre-lab, get some answers and then compare your measurement results in lab. Um, I talk a little bit about what we discussed last time about the potentiometer. Um, that, so, so this is some review. If you want, you can review the lecture or just read this pre-lab. And then I'm going to have you build this for lab. So this is a, uh, a voltage divider that is adjustable. So you're going to hook a four volt source to V in, and you're going to connect a voltmeter to V out, and you're going to design RA and RB such that when you turn the potentiometer to its limits, uh, you'll have a certain range of voltage. And so that's down here in the design problem. So you're going to do some analysis on finding voltages in the fixed resistor circuits. And then let me get down to the design problem here. So you have this table of requirements, right? So, so uh, you're going to design that circuit such that using a voltage divider equation, uh, such that when you turn the potentiometer all the way counterclockwise, you get two volts at the output. And when you turn the potentiometer all the way clockwise, you get three volts at the output, plus or minus 10%. Right? So if you wind up with resistor values that aren't in your kit, you can either try the closest standard value, or if that doesn't get you close enough, um, you can combine resistors in series to form a single resistor out of combined resistors. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a preview of that. And then there's some questions, but this is the circuit you're going to uh, design. Okay, so take a look at that. Uh, professor? Yes. I actually wanted to ask, like when I was reading over the pre-lab, um, I don't know if I quite understood it. So what's the significance of like adding RA and RB there to um, on either side of where the potentiometer is going to be? Right, so the significance of that is this, that if I, if I didn't have RA and RB, or if I just put wires in their place, um, 
the, the output voltage would range from zero volts to four volts, okay? So, so when I turn the potentiometer all the way to the left, I would measure zero volts, all the way to the right, I would measure four volts. So what RA and R, RB do is they actually create a, a voltage divider such that when you turn the potentiometer knob all the way to the left, you get two volts, all the way to the right, you get three volts. So it limits the range of voltage. Let's suppose this was a, um, uh, let's say a, a, uh, an input to a pressure sensor trigger circuit that would release an emergency valve if the pres pressure got out of range. Um, and maybe you only want a range of two to three volts on the adjustment. That's what the purpose of this would be. But let me scroll up here to, to the, let's see, right here. So, not that one. No, I guess it's not right there. So, so what you're doing is you're actually adding resistors on top, of, a resistor on top of R1 and on the bottom of R2 so that you're effectively changing the voltage divider so there's more resistance in, in this lower resistor, right? You're going to maybe add a you know, 1K resistor, 5K resistor. So that resistor becomes bigger. Um, you can't turn it all the way down to zero. And the same thing up at the top. It limits the minimum resistance of this top resistor because, you know, with a potentiometer, you could turn that resistance all the way down to zero. But with another resistor in series with this resistor, you, you couldn't turn that resistor down to zero. So it, it limits the, uh, the voltage range. Okay, I see, thank you. Sure. Okay, so, so take a look at that. It's a really practical circuit. They're used as, for example, in thermostats as a voltage reference. Um, you're also going to see if you connect a load resistor to the voltage divider, uh, the voltage divider doesn't work like it originally did, and that's intentional. So voltage dividers are only uh, theoretical voltage dividers if you account for the load resistor connected to the output. So you'll see that during lab. So what I'd like to do today is continue on with node voltages and node voltage analysis. So I have a slide up here. This is what we talked about Last time, we defined node voltages. Node voltages are, are voltage labels, voltage variables, sitting next to nodes. And when you don't have a polarity assigned, you must have a reference node defined. That's what this ground symbol or reference node symbol is. And it's assumed that that is the negative side for every node voltage. So if I put V2 here, V2 is the voltage between that brown node and the blue node. V3 is the voltage between the purplish node and the blue node, okay, with the polarities shown. Negative is always at the reference node. And then I said, well, you can, you can, move, uh, you can move the reference node uh, to another point that doesn't change the circuit, but then your node voltages are measured with respect to some other node. The negative sign is always at the reference node. Usually when you have a circuit, you define a ground, a reference node, and you leave it there. You usually don't change it. But I just wanted to show you that if, if you did move the reference node, the node voltages change because they are measured with respect to a different point in the circuit. So that's the definition uh, of node voltages. What I want to do now is show you how to calculate node voltages, and that's called node voltage analysis. And as a step in that direction, I want to talk about um, calculating other circuit variables like current using node voltages. Because what we're going to do is we're going to, node voltage analysis, spoiler alert, is this. Um, it is using KCL, applying Kirchhoff's current law at every non-reference node. That's all it is. And so I'll show you that. But as a, a stepping stone to that, let me first show you this. After you have the node voltages, you are one or two steps away from all other circuit variables. In other words, currents and, and power values, okay? And you'll see next, you're going to use the current value to solve for node voltages. It means more once I show the example, and I will. So let's suppose we have this circuit, and this circuit, um, let's just concentrate on resistor R1. And I've defined two, um, 
two voltages, two node voltages, V1 and, and V2. Okay. Let's do this. Let's figure out what the voltage is across R1 and what the current is through R1 from left to right. Okay, I've just, I've just picked those values just, to, just as an example. So to do this, let me simplify this. Let me break out this part of the circuit and, and draw it next door, right next to the circuit. And so we're gonna assume still this, this is a sub-circuit. It's still connected in the circuit, but V1 is on the left, V2 is on the right, R1 is the resistor, and I want to calculate Ix and Vx. And so to do that, let me explicitly write the polarities for V1 and V2. V1 node voltage means its positive side is up near the variable. It's at the node where the variable is next to. And the negative sign is at the ground. Same thing for V2. So I can solve for Vx using a KVL around a loop here. So if I say minus V1 plus Vx plus V2 equals zero, right? Minus V1 plus Vx plus V2 equals zero, just a loop. Um, I can solve for Vx. So if I knew V1 and V2, I could solve for the voltage across that resistor. Okay. If I wanted that current, well, now I know the voltage across that resistor and I want to find the, the current through the resistor. I can use Ohm's law. Ix is Vx over R1, right? It's just Ohm's law for this resistor. Okay, so, so that lets me substitute Vx uh, into from KVL into Ohm's law. And so this is the equation you're gonna use. You're gonna see this a lot. This equation says this, let me talk it out in words, that the current through a resistor, through that resistor R1, from node V1 to node V2 is V1 minus V2 over R1, right? In the direction from V1 to V2 through the resistor, this is the current, V1 minus V2 over R1. We're gonna use that. Okay, so let me do this. Let me define up here a voltage with the opposite polarity. Let's suppose you wanted to find, well, that voltage across the resistor with the opposite polarity and the current going in the other direction. Uh, well, it's the same thing. You, you can break out that portion of the circuit. <clears throat> let me define Vy and Iy across that resistor. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'll write a KVL, right? Minus V1, minus Vy, plus V2, back to the starting point, equals zero. And so I get Vy is V2 minus V1. Then by Ohm's law, Iy is Vy over R1, right? Just Ohm's law for that resistor. And now I have this other equation. Iy is V2 minus V1 over R1. So what this says, what this equation says, if, if you want the current leaving from node V2, going through a resistor to node V1, that current is V2 minus V1 over R1. And you might say, wait a minute, I have arrows in opposite directions through this resistor. How could that be? Well, remember, if I just flip a reference direction, an arrow, around for a current, I just apply a negative sign to that current to flip the arrow. And that's what this is on the right. These, are, these actually represent the same magnitude of current, but they're in opposite directions, right? One is uh, Ix is V1 minus V2, and Iy is V2 minus V1, right? One is negative of the other. So, so, uh, so, that's, so these are takeaways. I'll use this next, but I wanted to show you once you have your node voltages, you can calculate currents through these resistors. And we'll do an example of this. You're also a step away, a quick step away from power. So power um, is I times V. So, or once you know the voltage, let's say across that resistor R1, which is Vx or Vy, either way, uh, you square that voltage and you divide by R1 and you get the power. So once you have node voltages, you're, you're one, maybe two steps away from other circuit variables in the circuit. And so what's neat is node voltage analysis, that's what I'm going to show you, uh, solves for those node voltages. Okay, any questions on this? I'm going to move to the whiteboard, but if you have any questions on this, uh, 
uh, let's address those now or, or after if you, you think of any. Uh, I have a question, Professor. Sure. So here we are, um, and, and I think I think some of the symbology Im implied this, but I don't think it was explicitly said. So the reference node, we consider voltage there to be zero? Yes. Okay, gotcha. That's right. So the reference node, the, so if, if V1 is five volts and V2 is 10 volts, whatever, it, they, they're, no, they can be zero volts. The reference node is always zero volts. It's like taking a voltmeter and touching, uh, the black lead to this node and also the red lead to the same node. And whenever you touch a voltmeter to the same node, you, you get zero volts. There's zero volts between a node and itself. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Okay. And oh yeah, good question. So won't, won't uh, V squared over R always give positive power? It will, resistors never supply power. They always absorb power. They're a passive component. That's where the passive reference configuration comes from. So it will always be positive. So even if you have, let's say, negative two volts squared, you'll still have a positive power once you square the voltage. I got a okay. super quick question or maybe a sure. request. Like, is there any good visual relations? I'm trying to remember back even physics and as far as like high school physics, I believe it was like the P, it's like a circle and then the P is in the upper half and then it's like a T and you have IV or I don't know if you know any visual representations that might be helpful to link um, if or any tricks as far as the equation goes. I know it's a simple equation, but maybe relating it to the wave thought there. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've seen that there's a circle and it's kind of divided into yeah, segments yeah, yeah. and it's, it's, yeah, I'll, I'll post it if I can find it, but that, to tell you the truth, that's always confused me because I always remembered the equation and arrow pointing into the positive. Uh, for for Ohm's law, I've seen it for Ohm's law, and then for power, I've seen something for power. But but uh, if I let me take a look at for that, and I'll post it. And if it confuses you, don't look at it. And if it helps you, keep it. Yeah, appreciate that. Always looking for little visual reminders to link it all together. Thanks. Sure thing. Okay, so let's do this. Um, I am going to. show you a whiteboard now. Okay, so you should see a whiteboard. And let me bring up, my chat always disappears. When I bring up the whiteboard. All right. Okay, so here, here's a typical node voltage analysis problem. It, um, node, the, the typical node voltage analysis problem has uh, current sources and resistors. And there's a way to handle voltage sources. You'll see that in your next lab, in that pre-lab. Um, but let's start out with a, with a typical example. So I have resistor values here and they are all known, right? They're all known values. It's, you know, 10 ohms and 20 ohms, 50 ohms, 800 ohms, whatever. All those resistor values are known. The current source is known. It could be two amps, negative six amps, whatever. It's, it's a known value. And what the, the unknown values are V1, V2, and V3. So you want to find out the node voltages, and I have a reference node defined. You always have to have a reference node defined if you have node voltages drawn. Okay. Node voltage analysis uh, comes down to this. Write KCL at every non-reference node. So everywhere except where there's a ground connected, you're going to write a Kirchhoff's current law equation. So let's do that. <clears throat> the form that I typically adopt and, and many books adopt is to sum the currents leaving a node. So we're going to sum the currents leaving the node associated with V1, V2, and V3. That's going to give us three equations. We have three equations and three unknowns. This technique guarantees that we're going to have a linearly independent set of equations. And 
enough equations to solve for the variables we're looking for. Okay, so it, it, there's a lot of talk. It's a lot easier to do it than just talk about it. Let me, let me just do it. So I'm gonna say uh, KCL1. So Kirchhoff's current law at node one. So we're going to sum the currents leaving this node, current that way with the current that way with the current that way, and then set those currents equal to zero. This is where that equation I just talked about comes in. Let's, uh, let's, let's write this equation in terms of the voltages and the known resistors and the known current source. So the current leaving from V1 to V2 through R2, and, and we, just, we just wrote this equation, is V1 minus V2 over R2. Okay, so that's the current leaving from left to right through R2. The current leaving, let's say this top node here, through the current source, well, that's just IS, that's specified. So it's going to be plus IS, right? IS is going left to right through that source, so is that direction that I've defined leaving this node. The current going down through R1, that final current, uh, is, is equal to uh, V1, this node voltage, minus the node voltage on the other side of R1, which someone already pointed out, that's zero volts, right? This, this node voltage, the node voltage of the reference node is always zero volts. Okay, so that current going down through R1 is V1 minus zero over R1. Right, so now I've written all the currents, I've summed them together, all the currents leaving that node. So I set that equal to zero. Okay, so, so, so that's, that's the equation. Uh, let me simplify this a little bit. You know, this is really one over R2 times V1 minus one over R2 times V2. I can collect these terms. Let me collect all the terms for V1. So I'm going to get, uh, let's see, one over R1 plus one over R2 V1, right, that's the V1 term, minus one over R2 V2 equals minus IS. So I'm putting this in a form where you have a coefficient times V1 plus a coefficient times V2 equals a constant. Okay, so that that's so this is your this is your one of the three equations that we need to solve for the node voltages. And you just apply this to the other nodes. Let me write uh, KCL2. So KCL2 will, at, at node two, will look like this. I'm going to sum the currents leaving this node. So current going that way, plus the current going that way, plus the current going that way. So sum currents leaving that node. Okay. Um, so now, let's see, what's that equation? That is going to be, well, let's start uh, current to the left through R2. So that will be V2 minus V1 over R2, right? Well, wait a minute, in the, past, the last equation, I said it was going left to right, not right to left. Well, if you look at these terms, one is just the negative of the other. So that's okay, you can have arrows going in the opposite direction. Uh, one current value is negative of the other, okay? All right, so that's the current going to the left through R2. The current going down through R3 is V2 minus zero over R3. And then the current going to the right is V2 minus V3 over R4. And I've summed all the currents leaving, set that equal to zero. So now I have um, another equation I can write out in a little more standard form. Let me collect coefficients. The coefficient of V1 uh, minus one over R2, V1. Uh, V2 has a one over R2 plus one over R3 plus one over R4, uh, V2 plus, 
let's uh, let's see what's our third, v3 v3 is minus one over r4 minus oh, oh did I miss no I didn't I got that minus one over r4 v3 okay equals zero okay let's see if I did that right so coefficient of v3 v1 Two, three, four. Yeah, that looks right. So, so this is equation. Now, this looks a little complicated, but remember, the resistors are all known. So, this is just a number times v1, another number times v2, another number times v3 added together equals zero. Same thing down here. You know the source. It's just a number, and then you have numbers as coefficients in front of v1 and v2. So, now we have two equations, but three unknowns. So, let's do KCL3. Right. So finally, at the third node, to get our third equation, I'm going to sum the currents leaving, right? S write a KCL at every non-reference node. That's all we do here. It's a pretty elegant little technique here. Okay, so the current, let's say going up out of V3, well, yeah, to the left out of V3 through the current source IS is negative IS, right? The current going the opposite direction right to left is negative IS. Um, the current going through R4 from, from V3 to V2 is V3 minus V2 over R4. The current going down through R5 is V3 minus zero, right? Zero volts down at the bottom. V3 at the top, we're looking for current going top to bottom over R5. So I have those three branches of current leaving the node, set that equal to zero. And then, okay, let's rearrange this. So let's get the coefficient for V2 minus one over R4. V2 plus one over R4 plus one over R5. V3, so that's the coefficient of V3 equals, see, I'll have V1, V3 and V2, IS. Okay, so let me underline these equations. I just wrote through my subscripts. That's a five. That's a five. That's a four. Um, so now I have three equations and three unknowns, all by just methodically writing Kirchhoff's current law at each non-reference node. They're guaranteed to be independent. They will always be independent um, uh, when, when you have this kind of you know, resistors and, and sources like this. Uh, and, and so now we're not, we're not in circuits anymore. We're just solving simultaneous equations in math or linear algebra, right? So um, at this point, you can solve for these equations, three equations, three unknowns, solve for these variables any way you want. If you have uh, a calculator or MATLAB that uh, solves for matrices, that's how I do it. I write this as a matrix in matrix form. Um, and you can do that. If you have an equation solver on your computer or calculator, you can do that. You can use your equation solver and uh, and use that. What I do is, let me see if I can fit this in here. Um, I like to form this as a system of equations expressed as a, a matrix. Okay, so what, what I would do is looking at this first equation, I'm going to have the, uh, let's see, a big matrix here. Let me do it over here. So I would have uh, one over, oops, one over R1 plus one over R2, right? That's just an, a number. That's the coefficient of V1 down here in the lo lower left. Uh, minus one over R2 is the coefficient of V2. And then let's see, zero is the coefficient of V3. Oh, I that a little better. So I'm going to have this multiplied by 
V1, V2, V3 equals. And let's see, the next equation is minus one over R2 for the coefficient of V1. This one, it's hard to fit. One over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over R3. It's the coefficient of V2 in the second equation and then minus one over R4. Right, those are just numbers in a matrix. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine entries here. And then finally, minus one over R4, one over R4 plus one over R5. It's a lot easier when you have numbers, you just put numbers in here. Nope, that's not, that's supposed to be V3. I'm, I messed it up by one entry. Okay, so, so these are the entries, the nine entries times V equals, and on the right hand side here you get, let's see, minus IS, zero IS. So you plug all those numbers in here and you get a matrix equation. So let me, let me erase this uh, on the right so I can, so I can show you this. So I'm going to call this matrix, big matrix G. Um, I'm going to call this uh, column matrix here V. I'm going to call this um, I. Okay. And so uh, G, G times V equals I. Hey, that looks familiar. That looks a lot like Ohm's law, right? A conductance times a voltage which this conductance is one over resistance equals a current. So that looks a lot like Ohm's law. It's kind of neat the way that works. Uh, but if you want to solve for V, V equals G inverse, that's an inverse, uh, times I. Okay, so this is, this is how I solve it. It's a lot easier when you're just entering these numbers into your calculator or MATLAB. You have nine numbers, you enter them into a matrix. You invert that matrix. Um, and then you multiply by the column matrix, right? Those values, and, and you get V. It, it just, you know, linear algebra works. So you can do this, or you can solve using simultaneous, uh, a simultaneous equation solver. Either way, uh, that's fine. Okay, so you'll have some practice problems, and your next pre lab will have a node voltage analysis problem in it. Um, and it'll show you some hints when you have a voltage source uh, in, in the circuit. But in general, any questions about, about this approach in, in using node voltage analysis on this circuit? Okay. Okay, and again, if you have any uh, questions on any, any material in class, I'm happy to stick around uh, for office hours and talk about it too. Okay, let me get... Back to my screen here. So, so this is where this wound up. So once you have your node voltages, you have V1, V2, V3, you are one step away from calculating every other voltage right? or, or every other current, which you had to use in the KCL equations, um, or power. Right? Once you have the voltage across a resistor, uh, you, you can calculate power. So it's, it's a really useful technique to systematically solve for node voltages and then get any other circuit variable that you want. Uh, professor? Yes. So um, you kind of touched on this when we first uh, talked about um, the equations we derived from this, but so in general, like it's okay that we're switching the reference polarities, but we want um, 
so the current that we're solving for, we want it to be like um, going away from the voltage, like non-reference voltage node we're looking at. Yeah. So you, uh, so yeah, yeah. Let me see. Let me see if this explains it. Um, I, I sum currents leaving every node um, because it lets me use this equation on the right over and over again without changing it. So, uh, you know, if I, if I sum the current leaving V1, it's V1 minus V2 over R1. If I sum the current, you know, into that equation going down, V1 minus zero over R, whatever that was. Um, and then when you, when you switch directions, instead of V1 minus V2, I use V2 minus V1. Uh, does that get to your question or, or, or did, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yes, I think so. I think um, I was just, you know, making sure that um, we're just switching the reference polarity when we look at the um, different um, voltages. Yes, so for voltages, if you want Vx, it's always V1 minus V2. If you want Vy, it's V2 minus V1. So the first voltage in the subtraction of node voltages uh, is where the positive sign is. And then because of Ohm's law here on the right, uh, because you're using that polarity, you know, I always points into the positive side of V. That's why you use V2 minus, or a V1 minus V2 to solve for IX and V2 minus V1 to solve for IY. Okay. All right. So, you know, that's, that's a technique you probably haven't, seen before. Um, if you have, it's a great review just to see how, how someone does it. What I want to talk about now is Thevenin equivalent circuits and maximum power transfer. So Thevenin equivalent circuits let you do this. They let you have a circuit inside of a black box, you know, black box like your cell phone, your radio, your uh, some ports on your PC. And you can describe the behavior of that circuit when you connect a resistor to it. You can describe that behavior with just a voltage source and a resistor value. No matter how complex the circuit is inside, which it needs to function, for interface purposes, just to connect to it and deliver power to something like a speaker or from a microphone to a microphone input or, or, or from a computer USB port to something else, um, you can describe it very simply. And that's what this is all about, the Thevenin equivalent circuits, to get some kind of power transfer and sometimes maximum power transfer. Okay, so, so let's talk about this. Let's talk about voltage versus current for resistive circuits. So let's suppose you have uh, any linear circuit with resistors and sources. Okay, so uh, what's that mean? That means that you have a bunch of resistors connected together, series, parallel, neither, um, and you have dependent sources that might be like uh, Vs equals four times Iy, as long as that equation is linear. You can't have any squareds or anything like that in there, e to the whatever. Um, you have to have a linear equation uh, for any dependent sources and independent sources. And it works for DC or, or AC. Let's concentrate on DC. So I connect a load to this circuit. A load is just a re resistor. So this resistor behaves like Ohm's law. Let's define a voltage across that load resistor and a current from this uh, into the load resistor. And suppose this linear circuit in the blue box is, you know, it's a source. It's a stereo output. It's going to drive a speaker or something like that. And the load would be the speaker. Okay. Let's do a plot. Let's create a plot of voltage versus current for a particular value of R sub L. So if you just put a dot on the graph, you, you connect a resistor, I don't know, 100 ohms, and you're going to get some current through it. You can measure that. And some voltage across it, you can measure that or, or calculate those. And you put that dot on, on this graph of voltage versus current for that resistor. Let's take the resistance to an extreme. 
uh, let's make the resistance infinity, right? That's a big value. And so at that point, no current flows. So the current goes to zero and the voltage goes up to some value. Let's take the, um, let's give a name to that voltage since I'm open circuited with, with an infinite resistance. Let's call that the open circuit voltage, VOC. OC is open circuit. And so then let's go to the other extreme. Let's say that you have a short circuit across the resistance, uh, across the load, across a, you know, a to B up here. I have a zero ohm resistor, which is practically, it's just a wire. Then the voltage goes to zero, um, but the current goes up, okay? And what you would notice, and this is the behavior for linear circuits with sources and resistors, what you would notice is this, these points all fall on a straight line and they go from the open circuit voltage down to this, what we call the short circuit current. So when you short the terminals, you're gonna have the short circuit current and you get this line. And that's uh, it's straightforward to write an equation for that line. So VL, the load voltage, the voltage across that load resistor is equal to VOC minus VOC over ISC times IL. So VOC is the intercept point minus VOC over ISC is the slope of that line, right? It's an equation for the line. Well, so what I'm gonna show you is you can create a, an equivalent circuit for this, any circuit with linear sources and resistors in, in a box. So let's talk about how to, how to do that, how to, how to determine the linear circuit. So this is what we had on the prior slide. We want to find an equivalent simple circuit to make analysis easier and also to characterize something like a stereo output without giving the entire schematic because if you just care about connecting a load that's resistive, it doesn't matter. You can get all the behavior you want, uh, understand all the behavior you want out of that circuit if you just know the equivalent circuit outside of the box. So this is that equation. We want to find an equivalent simpler circuit from the load's perspective, from this resistor's perspective, any circuit that has the same voltage versus current relationship will be equivalent. You're measuring voltage, you're measuring current. Um, if you change resistor values and, and that line is formed, the same line is formed between either this circuit in the blue box or the equivalent circuit. If voltage versus current's the same, the circuits will be equivalent. Well, let's simplify this equation a little bit. Let's define, uh, a variable that represents the slope, actually the negative slope, of uh, VOC over ISC. I'm gonna call that R sub T. It's actually the Thevenin resistance. Uh, and, and so that's just the slope. And if we plug that slope in, actually the negative of the slope, you get VL equals VOC minus RT times IL. So uh, an equivalent circuit will have this relationship, right? It'll, it'll have this same VL versus IL relationship. Let's create, let's draw a circuit that has the same relationship. No matter what's going on in this complex circuit, let's draw a simple circuit that has the same relationship, meaning this equation applies to that circuit. Okay, so let me go to the, let me show you this. Uh, this is what we want the circuit to do. This is what we, we derived for that straight line across the graph. Let me propose a circuit. Let's suppose this circuit is as simple as a single voltage source and a single resistor. Let's try this. So here is just a voltage source with the value VOC, the open circuit voltage. Here is the Resistance RT, which is VOC over ISC, right? That was on the prior slide. And then I connect a load to it. And I measure the load voltage and I measure the load current. Um, let's add this voltage, IL times RT, right? That would be the voltage across the Thevenin resistance uh, in the circuit. And this is so I can write a Kirchhoff's voltage law KVL equation. So let's do that. Let's write a KVL equation. Let's start here at the lower left, minus VOC plus IL RT 
plus VL equals zero. Okay, so I get that equation. And if I rearrange this equation, look what I have. I have VL equals VOC minus RTIL. And that's the same equation on the left. Now, I, now you're kind of trusting me. You're trusting me that any linear circuit with resistors and sources uh, does this, behaves like the blue box on the left. And I'm saying, if you believe that, I believe it. Um, uh, you can prove it. Um, then this circuit at the bottom, the bottom left, has the same relationship between VL and IL. So this, everything to the left of these terminals, like the source and the resistor, represents its equivalent to that original circuit. RT is called the Thevenin resistance, and we're going to, in honor of Mr. Dr. Thevenin, we're going to call we're going to call the open circuit voltage the Thevenin voltage. Okay, so the Thevenin equivalent circuit is this any linear circuit with resistors and sources, right, can be represented with its Thevenin equivalent, which is a voltage source and a resistor. And that's what's on the, the right. Okay, so from the perspective of anything connected to terminals A and B on the left and the right, if I put the left circuit in a box, I put the right circuit in a box, and I give you a voltmeter, an ammeter, and a bunch of resistors, you would not be able to tell the difference if I get VT and RT right. Okay. Okay, so why would you want to do that? You'd want to do that um, because let's suppose, for example, you need to find the power values delivered to a load resistor for five different values of RL. Right? So you're going to change RL to be five different values and you want to find the power delivered. And let's suppose uh, this is the circuit, right? It's this really complex circuit and it would take you a while to analyze. So to determine for each RL value what the power delivered to RL was, you would need to analyze this whole circuit five times. Every time you change RL, you change the circuit. You have to reanalyze. Instead, you can analyze that complex circuit just once and calculate the Thevenin equivalent. You're, you still have to use the circuit and, and work with it and derive the Thevenin equivalent. But once you have the Thevenin equivalent, I can attach five different resistors to that Thevenin equivalent and analyze this circuit on the lower right five times instead of analyzing the circuit on the left five times with five different resistors. Right? So that's just one example of why you might use the Thevenin equivalent. Uh, I have okay. a question. Yeah. Say, for example, instead of A and B being where they are right now, they're like, in the bottom left-hand corner, would we be able to use the, the yeah, the, like oh, where that resistor is on the bottom? Yeah, um, yeah. Would we be able to like do the same thing, or is it solely because they are like that resistor is isolated from everything else? Um, so, so I have to define two terminals, and now if I change the location of A down to the lower left corner, then then I've changed the circuit. You're going to have a different Thevenin, Thevenin equivalent in in general. But there's no reason yeah. I couldn't come down here and, and draw, let's say, a C, right, terminal C. And then I could connect a resistor between terminal C and terminal B. And I could find the Thevenin equivalent for the circuit between C and B. It'd be different, but you could find that, yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. So, so that's, that's the setup, right? That's the reason you want to find, in some cases, a Thevenin equivalent circuit. Um, and what I'm going to show you, we'll start next time, is, is how do you calculate the Thevenin equivalent? Because your whole job in calculating the Thevenin equivalent is to determine two values, VT and RT. And from what you know now, from what you've done uh, in your homework so far, you'll be able to calculate VT and RT based on, um, based on given a circuit and a KCL, KVL, voltage division, et cetera. Okay. Okay, so let's close here. We'll continue this next time. Um, just as a reminder, pick up your, your EE kit so you can get your resistors and your breadboard. You'll use that in your, your next lab. That, uh, that, that will be uh, the next lab that you perform on Friday. Um, check out the assignments on, on Canvas.
see that schedule. Check the Slack workspace out. Of, uh, I've been seeing, I've been answering a lot of questions and other people are answering questions uh, even before I get there. Thanks for doing that. That's, I think it's really helpful for everybody to participate on that and share different perspectives of how to solve the circuits. Um, so thanks for joining the class. I hope it's working out well. Let me know if it's not. I'm glad to hear if, it's, if there's anything I can improve about this whole experience of learning remotely. So I will start office hours in about two minutes. I'll go on mute for a couple minutes uh, so folks can drop off. If you want to stick around and ask questions or just listen to other people's questions, you are welcome to do so. Um, if not, I will talk to you uh, in class next time or, uh, or see you on Slack.